Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to give it a few more minutes before we get started. several people joining us thank you for um thank you for being here good morning we're we will give it a few more minutes let a few more people pop in in the meantime if you would like to go to the q a section and let us know what you've always wanted to test if there is um something that you've always wanted to test and we will talk about that as we go we're near the end thank you so much Thank you to everyone joining. I think we are going to get started. Um, before we do, if you're just joining us, if you would like to go to the Q&A and let us know something that you've always wanted to test and our pros will get to those um, and answer you or talk about those at the end of the webinar. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Would you like to get started, Kayla? I would love to. Good morning, guys. Thanks for being here or afternoon. I suppose it is noon here on the East Coast. So thanks everyone for joining. We're so excited to uh, share some digital uh, testing strategies with you today. Um, I'm Kayla Twain. For those of you who don't know me, I'm VP of Digital Strategy and I'm going to hand it over to Lindsay for a quick intro. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lindsay Park and I am Director of Media Planning. I'm um, passing it off to Mike. Hi, folks. Mike Crump, VP of Digital Media. Uh, looking forward to speaking with you all today. And lastly, I'll pass it off to Van. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, everyone. I'm Van Doe. I'm a senior digital strategy here at Moore. Uh, really pleased to be here with you all. So before we get right into it, I don't know if you guys heard Joey at the beginning of the meeting, but uh, we are collecting uh, a wish list of things you've always wanted to test in the Q&A session that we will circle back to at the end of the meeting. So if you haven't already, drop that in the Q&A. Um, some quick housekeeping items just to tee us all off. Uh, this testing webinar is really going to encompass all digital channels. So that's web, that's paid social, that's paid search. Uh, email, SMS, we really have a smattering of channels so that we can touch on everything uh, today. A quick caveat, uh, this is not meant for you guys to hear these learnings and then immediately run and roll out as fact across uh, your organization. Um, you know, testing results really vary based on a lot of different factors, whether that be existing brand equity in the market, audience strategy, all those good things. So we just want to make sure that this is meant to inspire your organization's testing strategy. So, oh, this worked for that organization. This is really cool. I want to test that for my organization, right? Um, all examples that we're going to share today have been anonymized. So um, they've been anonymized. We'll speak to what vertical that client is in, but we will not be uh, saying the client's name by any means just to protect that anonymity. Um, and they have been cleared by those clients. So we have cleared that as well. Um, this is a unique uh, pre presentation situation in that normally we would kind of like say, okay, hold all questions for the end, but we're going to be going through each test. So we would say once we get through the results of a test, so we're going to like set up the test, share the results, and then once we do that for one test, we're going to open it up for questions for that particular test. So Joey's going to be uh, monitoring the Q&A and letting us know one or two questions. So we'll open it up and say, does anyone have any questions about that? At that point, we'd ask that you drop your question in the Q&A, and then we will address before moving on to the next one. Does that sound good? 
We're very excited. This is really cool stuff. So thanks for being here with us today. I know it's the middle of giving season and no one has a spare hour. So it's not lost on us that you uh, chose to spend it with us today. All right, I'll hand it over to Lindsay. Thank you. Um, so starting off strong with the test on paid search uh, around the impact of including additional privacy language on donation forms. So as we're continuing to navigate the ever changing media landscape, uh, particularly around data privacy concerns and policy like the use and accuracy of cookies, pixels, etc. Um, organ organizations are rightfully cautious about doing uh, everything that we can to ensure that we're not only following best practices, but also being transparent about how our donor data is collected and used. So one of our clients wanted to include privacy legal language kind of as a footnote or fine print on all of our donation pages. And so we proposed testing this edition first uh, before rolling out universally. Um, and we hypothesized that it would not be that that additional language would not ne be necessary and could in fact um, negatively impact conversion rates since that would essentially be almost a distraction for anyone uh, who was um, on the journey to donate um, and calling out how collected data is used would essentially open up a can of worms potentially um, causing concern or potential mistrust when it wasn't there to begin with. So the best case scenario here would be um, that there was no difference between a standard donation page um, and the test with that additional language added. Next slide, please. Um, so we set this test up as an A-B experiment on Google Ads uh, because we really wanted to test the direct impact the, uh, on conversions this uh, language addition would add. Um, so we ran the test until 100% statistical significance, which took about a month or so to reach. Um, and initially results were very similar, um, but after about a week or two, uh, we started to see diverging trends between the two landing pages uh, set up. Uh, so the test page that included the privacy language had a 1.84% conversion rate compared to the control that had a 4.18% con conversion rate. Um, spend impressions and control uh, click-through rates were all very similar. However, the control generated um, some, almost 74% more revenue and 112% uh, more donations with the cost per donation that was about half of what we were seeing from, from the test. Um, so with the results of this test, we were successfully able to move away uh, the client away from including additional privacy language across all donation forms. And this test served as a great case study for other organizations uh, similarly concerned about including that kind of information um, on all uh, landing pages. Any questions? Cool. <clears throat> so our next test, um, was around the impact of influencers on driving lead generation on paid social. So we know that social influencers can make uh, a very large impact on building brand awareness, um, engagement, just general trust for an organization, as well as uh, serving as almost kind of like a direct pipeline or intermediary between that org and its donors or potential donors. Um, but because influencer campaigns are often organic or earned media, it can be difficult to gauge the efficacy and that direct impact. Um, and because we are all data-driven people, <laughs> we wanted to create a campaign environment that would be able to effectively determine influencer-driven results, um, evolving the influencer approach, if you will. So um, in phase one of this influencer partnership, we ran a general brand awareness campaign, but the client wanted to see how more concretely the impactor and influencer can have. Um, i.e. we wanted to see if we could tie any sort of growth impact an influencer has to like direct numbers, real numbers. So we hypothesized that social media influencers would encourage lead generation conversions, especially when paired with uh, a match component, because we all love matches, of course, uh, by being able to utilize and influence their follower base into learning more, like taking an action. This would help drive awareness, uh, bring in new leads, and tie the campaign with that direct ask. That is a low a enough ask uh, or easy enough ask to drive conversions and like determine that impact. Next slide. 
So for the results for this campaign, uh, the, the approach of this was, was twofold. Uh, we set this up as a conversion-based campaign directing to a lead capture form off-platform. Um, the ask here was for every signature or sign up, uh, $1 would be donated to that organization. Um, so that was kind of our setup on the platform side. And then separately, the influencer would push out content and messaging around the organization, the mission, uh, the ask for signatures, as well as that $1 donation match for um, every signature. Um, our lead gen campaign resulted in reaching over 350,000 unique individuals, uh, serving over 460,000 impressions, and almost 18,000 total engagement, including likes, comments, all, all of that kind of stuff lumped together. Um, we did see a 5% campaign engagement rate, which was even higher than the engagement rate we typically see in platform. Really, on Meta, anything above 1% is considered a decent, like a good engagement rate. Um, one to five is what we typically try to aim for. So that 5% was really great to see. Um, and a 53% conversion rate on the sign up page, uh, which led to capturing over a thousand new leads. Uh, we also saw a 3% growth in uh, the org's Instagram follower count during the campaign duration as a result. Um, and this approach saw really positive results. Uh, we were able to tie, again, actual data and numbers to the impact that an influencer partner can have on brands, while also uh, benefiting in real time from all those leads, that new leads that we were able to bring in. So lots of fun stuff. Any questions? We have a few questions. Um, when we first started, we asked, what tests would you like to um, try out and so i don't know if you want to answer this now or wait but there's testing a sustainer only ask versus an open-ended one one time or sustaining i think we were gonna was that the wish list uh yes ask for test okay we're gonna circle we back wait. to those at the end yep if you guys don't mind were there any questions on the specific um influencer related test that that um lindsay just shared we thought it was interesting to test lead gen there because we'd be tapping essentially into that influencer's own network. So that by using influencers, it exposed us to new audiences. And rather than going directly for an ask, we thought, wouldn't it be nice to see if they want to get involved with the organization by a lesser ask, such as providing an email, so that we could then cultivate those individuals and eventually turn them into donors. Does that make sense? It's almost like they were pre-primed or pre-warm yeah. prospects that we're trying to, you know, then cultivate once we get them in through the door. And of course, beyond just uh, just the folks that have uh, that did submit that lead form, uh, you know, we also were able to grow remarketing lists just through through retargeting pixels and um, you know engagement uh, engagement audiences. And what Mike means by that. I'm interpreting. Um, and what mine means is that we drove a bunch of new traffic by way of these campaigns to the website, right? And when we drive those new individuals who may be coming by way of that influencer's network, who may not know who that organization is, they're now landing on the website. Now, when they're landing on the website, we then can tag them and remarket, meaning we can then serve ads to those individuals and continue to cultivate them. So um, it just kind of helped overall just allow us to expose these individuals to multiple messages with the organization and it's just very neat because we could tap into the equity that exists between that relationship of that influencer and that person and parlay that equity into the organization which is really unique and exciting right they provide like more credibility um that kind of direct link between potential donors like new new uh, prospects and and that organization and seeing this kind of uh these kind of uh, kind of results especially on an off platform lead gen sign up uh, workflow was really great to see because typically off platform um like the in platform forms have way better cost uh costs associated with lead generation um so uh, it was really great to see that the impact that the influencer had on even something that was a little bit more um like less optimized for what we typically do for lead gen very very cool lindsay we have two questions um in the chat was it a paid influencer and the second question is did you test the influencer against a match only we did not test again. We didn't test against, there was no testing happening here. So that's a great question and one I anticipated. Uh, this was more of an evolution of approach to the influencer engagement as opposed to like 
and ask for a lead generation specifically. We mostly just wanted to like dip our toe into the water. Does this kind of engagement have legs in lead gen? That's the question we were hoping to answer. And now that we have that answer, we can get more granular with the testing match versus no match, et cetera. But this was really the first step there. Um, right. And then yes, these influencers were paid for their engagement. Yeah. So again, really just trying to like general influencer campaigns, you can assume <laughs> that, you know, that they're driving uh, in, uh, awareness and engagement. You can, uh, but with, with this type of approach, um, we are able to kind of, tie direct numbers uh, behind that the, the the impact that the influencer had um, because they're speaking directly to a campaign that we're also promoting um, on the paid side. And one more before we move on, have you measured donation rates for influencer leads versus other sources and how do they convert? Great question. So these, it's not, um it's not necessarily a stat we want to pull immediately, right? These individuals need to be cultivated just like any other leads. I would argue they may even need to be cultivated a little bit more because these individuals are coming by way of a relationship with the influencer as opposed to just having a pre-existing interest in your organization necessarily. So we wouldn't necessarily want to say, and this many converted immediately, right? Uh, within the first year, We'd like to see how many of these individuals converted and we haven't gotten there yet, but it's a great question and it is something we're actively monitoring. Great, so I'll I'll step in here um, on this next slide um, and this is a test between a monthly versus a one-time default ask. Um, and so for one of our clients in the human services uh, sector, um, their goal is to evolve their program to a sustainable first offer, um, especially in digital advertising. And I'm sure many of you um, have the similar goals for your program. So um, for this uh, organization, we ran a test in paid search with a one-time ask versus a monthly ask. Um, so the on the left-hand side is the one-time ask ring, as you can see, versus the test creative on the right-hand side, which led with the monthly offer. Um, and as you can see, in both cases, we kept this, um, the copy um, the same in terms of the overall landing page copy. And we also kept the search copy um, the same to isolate a single variable. So, um, next slide, please. What's the what's the result? Um, very interestingly, the test uh, the test page uh, generated more monthly donors, um, thirty five percent more to be exact uh, than the control. But when we dug into the data, we noticed that. Um, only 58% of those who converted on the test page uh, retained in the second month compared to um, those on the control. So um, what did we need to do differently? Um, I think for us, um, we needed to make sure that um, there was a strong um, stewardship focused donor journey in place for new recurring donors. So what that means is making sure that um, the program includes um, that the test um, condition includes um, conditional content in both the online and offline acknowledgement to, to acknowledge new recurring donors. Um, and um, frankly, really, um, really low hanging fruit and basic uh, best practices like ensuring that there's a new recurring donor welcome series in e um, in place in the email channel and a content journey that focus on retention and impact. Um, so the takeaway for us uh, for this client really is, um, and especially for many of you who have always on paid search, um, it's the channel that you can go to right away when you want to test something and you want a really immediate read because that's the program that's going to have the highest, that's the channel, excuse me, that's going to have the highest engagement and conversion. And 
um, for this organization at least, um, their investment is such that their program allows us to run a multivariate test um, that isolates um, and combines variables in search copy, offer language, and asterisk. So in summary, the key takeaway is making sure that your stewardship strategy is in place so that you're retaining new, newly acquired donors and um, ensuring that you always are thinking about the next test. In this case, for us, designing a multivariate test that allows us to test best practice is in the entire um, kind of UX, so to speak, including search copy, um, landing page copy, as well as asking. And I want to add to this too, because I love this example for so many reasons, because we learned something and we got this quick read, right? Okay, our test page generated 35% more sustaining donors than, than the control page. Great, right? If we're just evaluating on that one stat, we're like, roll it out. That's amazing, exactly. right? And that is a limited view. This is why it's so important to make sure you have a holistic view of the impact of these tests and it's not limited to like initial results, right? So when Van dug a little bit deeper, the monthly donors who converted on that test page had significantly lower retention rate in the second month. That means they dropped off. They may not have known they were making, they were signing up for a sustaining donation. That's why Van's saying it's really important that we you know, regurgitate that back to them. We let them know you signed up for a sustaining donation, right? And we have a nice journey in place. But that's why it's so important to just make sure you're evaluating not just the initial KPI, but like subsequent KPIs as well. Just digging a little bit deeper. I love that. Absolutely. Any questions on that? Okay. Next slide, please. So um, along the same line, um, we ran another test, and in this case, it was in the email channel. Um, so for this organization, part of their email template design is an evergreen um, content area at the um, at the foot of the email, so to speak, um, that just calls out their um, institutional um, case for impact as well as a donate button, um, as you can see on the left-hand side, um, that's what the default email template looks like. And for many of you, if um, this is not something that you are already doing in your email strategy, it's a great way to highlight um, giving opportunities in um, communication emails that you sent out um, outside of, um, of fundraising touches. So uh, we knew that this element of their email template um, is a steady source of revenue. Um, on average, it, um, it results in roughly 10% of the clicks and conversions from their emails um, in, that, in this kind of real estate on the email block. So um, our goal was to um, create more opportunities to highlight monthly giving. So what did we do? We went ahead and added a donate monthly, as you can see on the right-hand side, and um, rolled that out as a test. And what did we learn? Um, not surprisingly, the, um, the email version with more donate buttons what, um, increased the number of conversions. Not, not statistically significant. We only hit 59% um, statistical significance there. But the average gift decrease, especially the, from the one-time gifts that normally come in via email, um, decreased significantly. Um, so the control won on average gift. And unfortunately, it didn't result in any new monthly gifts. So for us, um, again, this is... Um, you know, asking for monthly gift is a long-term commitment for every program, um, as um, those of you at nonprofits know. And um, the key for us in this is focusing on areas um, in the email real estate that generates a lot of click, um, whether that be in the footer, whether that be in the header, and using um, email tools on the market like Hotjar and so on and so forth gives you the ability to really look at your emails and where your um, subscribers and donors are 
um, for you know, the hot areas where they're clicking and engaging with your emails. And in those areas, in those areas continue to um, test and highlight both one time and and recurring giving so that you're giving them the opportunity to um, to donate and engage with them um, to donate and engage with your organization excuse me um, depending on their intent to give any questions on that we do have a question. Can you share the size of the list that this test was sent to? Absolutely. Um, so the um, their email list size is um, is a little over a hundred thousand active engagements. So obviously, depending on the size of your email program, um, you're going to want to make sure that this test is in market long enough to achieve um, data that you can read, because I think for organizations with 100,000 um, emails and strong engagement rates, and what I'm talking about is um, a point one, excuse me, a um, 0.5% click-through rate um, or so about there, um, you're gonna, be able to get stronger read than smaller lists and obviously organization with larger list um, can get there even more quickly and um, with for those of you with larger lists it's the opportunity to test and really isolate on specific audience segments whether that be new donors second year from um, new which are your prime opportunities for um, immediate immediate upgrades to sustainers and is there an optimal size list to test this? Uh, that's, an, that's a really important question. I would say um, that it really depends on the um, engagement of your program. Um, and that's why um, it's, it's not about optimal list size, but how long you keep the, um, the test in market. And um, if you're, working with a uh, more team today your more team can um, help you really design the test or if you're working with a partner agency um, your partner agency can really help you design that test effectively or um, reach out to us um, as an um, follow-up and we'll be glad to kind of work with you on that great and before we move on what percentage do you use to reach confidence for us it's at least 95 percent um and that's based on a, min a minimum size in terms of conversion um, you can reach statistical significance but with 10 15 conversions um which frankly is sometimes you see in smaller email audiences um and segments um that still at least for us, um, not necessarily something you can bank on and successfully roll out. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, this is where I have a little bit more good news to share, so to speak, since we've looked at two tests that were uh, that. Um, allowed us to learn a lot, but couldn't, we couldn't roll out right away. So for this, um, this same organization, um, obviously looking at a um, organization's donation page, every um, copy element matters. And in this case, the call out language um, for Give Monthly um, allows us to really emphasize the impact that um, our client makes um, with the with their work. So um, what we chose to do was um, test um, the strength and the um, urgency of their mission using the um, recurring call out language. So as you can see there on the right hand side, excuse me, on the left hand side um, is standard language that 
many of you will have seen in um, shareable landing pages um, talking about the, the steady um, support of monthly gift. And on the right-hand side, we chose to amp up the urgency by talking about the fact that a monthly gift provides immediate um, crisis care, which is a um, central um, part of, the, of um, this client's um, mission. So by using a uh, really authentic and critical need language um, on the right-hand side, um, we found that the test version um, raised 60% um, more um, in revenue. Um, in this case, we did reach statistical significance with confidence. Um, and the um, average gift on the test version was also 20% higher. So um, the takeaway for us uh, really is, again, um, really looking at your landing page and especially high um, visibility area, top of page copy, um, donation buttons, call out language, in this case with the arrow, use those opportunities and think about the donor experience and how you can um, turn up the volume, so to speak, in the language and the design to create more impact. Any questions? Okay. All right, guys, so um, next up, we had a social campaign where we were testing plush sort of like stuffed animals as a premium for membership ask associated with a museum client. So our hypothesis was using a premium could help increase membership conversions in paid social. And the reason we thought this was we know premiums can be effective from a fundraising acquisition perspective, right? their first gift, getting new donors in the door, but would that same approach work with a like more heavy involved ask, something that's more uh, commitment, there might be more commitment involved in that ask, such as membership. So we decided to test it. We'll go to the next slide. So look how adorable this plush is, first of all. I just want to have a moment of silence for that because it is adorable. Um, so we had a baby lamb named Arthur, and we uh, rolled this out in social, as I mentioned, for three months, April to June 2024. Um, and we ran them alongside our existing membership ads. A lot of those existing membership ads are event-oriented, event benefits-oriented. So uh, sign up for this event, and you'll get uh, membership perks if you're a member. Cut the line. Uh, other kinds of perks associated. So we've typically for this organization uh, dangled those kinds of event perk uh, messages to, to garner conversion and it's worked really well. And so we decided to vary it up with this. So become a member, get a free plush baby lamb, Arthur. He is so sweet. He's posed all around the museum. It is adorable. The Arthur ads resulted in 123% more membership conversions than other live membership ad sets. Membership value nearly doubled. So that's super interesting to me because in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, we're gonna get a lot of the low level membership ask because people are just gonna wanna get this plush and then they're gonna wanna get out of there, right? And that's not what we saw. So um, membership value doubled while spend only increased 14%. That resulted in a return on ad spend of $1.41. We also saw click-through rate increase uh, by 17% and our landing page views were up 25% to the previous period. So driving a lot of traffic as well, which is really important. And we know traffic's super important because it feeds our retargeting pools, et cetera. So this was really exciting. Um, I know some of you may ask, okay, individuals who converted um, and became members by way of the plush, how does that compare in terms of LTV uh, and their membership value uh, long-term? Um, compared to someone who came in on another maybe events focused ad or something like that. We don't have that analysis yet, but we are tracking um, on it since we just wrapped uh, that test up in June. We are iterating on it and, and digging a bit further into those results. But initially, it was very exciting to see that this was a very successful tactic. Kayla, did the 
uh, there's a question in the chat. Did the plush memberships retain at a higher level than the event driven ones? So that's what I was just saying. We don't know yet. <laughs> um, that's what I was saying. We are an analyzing that. We don't have those results in yet, but that is something that is very much on our radar. Any other questions on this? We just thought it was a really nice way to vary the messaging, right? Because, uh, you know, it's also just, um, you know, constantly pushing ourselves to find new ways um, to message and get new new members in the door for our museum clients. Um, and so this was a little bit outside the box, a little bit different, but the client was totally on board to their credit and uh, willing to try. And then it just resulted in this boom and spike in memberships for them, which was really exciting. So kudos to this client for having an open mind and testing with us. There's another question. Um, did they promote the plush in the DM space? So what was that like? That's a great question. I, I don't recall off the top of my head. I want to say yes. I know there was a lot of on-site promotion of the plush. So in their store um, and other various on-site signage. Um, but I'll have to check for specifics on direct mail integration there, and I can get back to you guys on that. It's a great question. And then it looks right. like there was one one more question on this test about targeting if we were targeting existing donors uh, and prospects or just one of those segments. Uh, and I believe we were targeting uh, all segments with this with this. Tactic. That's right. All segments. That's right, Mike. We'll keep it moving. Okay, a web testing micro ask, um, conversion rate optimization, web testing micro ask. So um, we hypothesize that using a micro ask, if you're like, what is that? I'll explain in a second. Uh, in the emergency alert banner displayed on a humanitarian emergency landing page. So on an emergency landing page for this humanitarian services site, uh, client, um, will the micro ask help um, improve conversion on that page? Um, will it improve engagement and click through rate? And I'm going to show you what it looks like in a second. Uh, the rationale there is users are going to be more inclined to engage when they feel like a sense of control and agency over their actions. And so when we offer them the freedom to choose, we create an experience that resonates with their preferences. So that's it'll make a lot more sense when I, when we go to what it actually looks like. So we'll go to the next slide. So as a reminder, this is a banner on a landing page on a website. So that's what you're looking at. There is a control emergency alert test. And then there's a variant B um, at the bottom. And the difference is, if you can see on the top in the control, it says donate today, and that's your CTA, that's your call to action. And on variant B, you have, yes, I would like to donate, or no, I'm not interested in making a donation. So that's what I mean when I say micro ask. So there's, there's options. It's interesting, right? Like, why would I want to have a CTA of no, I'm not interested. But what we found is, um, there was a 63% stat sig lift of 99% in the desktop click rate. So it did drive click rate, right? And that kind of makes sense because you have more opportunity, like whether or not you're going to respond or not, you can click. So improving click rate, like, yes, I'm interested. No, I'm not. Uh, everyone can click here. And so by way of having everyone be able to click, that increased click rate. No real surprises there. 77% um, statistically significant lift of 95% in conversion rate. So that's super interesting. And then 174% lift in um, desktop. Oh, what do we say? RPV? I'm sorry. I'll have to. Res uh, <laughs> response per view. So thank you. That's uh, what it was. Response yeah. per view. So what we're saying overall here is. And just for those of you, because I know it's going to come up, the no, I'm not interested in making a donation wouldn't go to a donation page. It would not redirect to a donation page. It would redirect to an informative landing page where people could learn more about it, but they weren't necessarily pressured to make a donation. The yes, I would like to donate goes to a donation page. So just by positioning the ask in this way, we were able to improve response rate and conversions and lift overall responses. I thought that was super interesting. Any questions here? Got team anything I missed here? I 
think there's also applications here, maybe even an email like there. This is obviously on a website, but like there are applications of the ask versus like yes versus no in multiple different um, channels. And so just something to keep thinking of like this right here is a web banner, but it could be, you know, maybe this is something that this organization explores in email or explores in another placement as well. The yes versus no. And this is great also just from a stewardship perspective, you know, helping your your donors and your and your prospects not feel like you are just treating them like an ATM, right? You know, you do value exactly. what it, uh, how they feel about things. And, you know, especially, you know, when everyone is getting so inundated with, uh, let's just say, uh, less uh, responsive uh, fundraising messages from the political sector during, you know, during election season, something like this is such a, bre a fresh breath of fresh air, um, right. you know, to feel valued by the organization that is that is talking to you. And to give them autonomy, right? I feel like and just say like, no, I don't want that. But and we're not and then you they're not clicking no and going to, to a donation page, right? Because that would really defeat the purpose. So they're clicking no and we're hearing them and we're giving them an opportunity to learn more, but we're not applying pressure to donate at that moment. And that's important in cultivating your donors. And Kayla, I'll also also mention that uh, what a lot of the more programs and many um, of the folks, many of you folks, I think will have tested into this, um, but certainly um, the evolution of this test could be varying the look and feel of the two buttons. So making yeah. sure that yes is more prominent than the no, so that the eyes, you know, the user's eyes is drawn to that option. And yeah. then, and then certainly, um, I think the best practice that um, that a lot of organizations can bake into their program is for those um, who click on no, offering them a way to stay in touch and be reminded of the opportunity to support. And that's something you can achieve through um, Form based tactics in your program with triggered emails. Um, and so use your tech stack to think about that user experience, work with your with your technical team, working with your um, more team or agency partner or reach out to us. Great point, man. And personally, I sort of love in this test that they're equally weighted in importance. Yeah, exactly. Like I sort of love that though. Um, and I think that's is an important piece of it, but I love the the iteration you mentioned of varying the weight between the two. Um, it is an interesting proposition for sure. OK, next up. All right, we had a Thanksgiving SMS landing page test. Um, and so we were hypothesizing that a giving modal, so a modal being like a pop up, right, um, will increase conversion rates for mobile users. And that is for the donation page. So the rationale is SMS campaigns are made for mobile users, right? <laughs> By nature of SMS, it's coming in on your phone. And a giving modal that is optimized for mobile might make that whole experience a lot smoother as opposed to your SMS. Uh, donation page being like optimized for desktop or et cetera, right? So making sure that donation page is really optimized for the channel in which you're operating. Um, and so seems pretty intuitive, but it's not always the case. And so we love that we tested into this for a specific organization and we had some really great results. So next slide, please. The modal, which is on the right, uh, had a much higher conversion rate than the traditional landing page, which is on the left. Um, so as you can see, it's optimized, it's a pop up. And so that modal, interestingly, not only did it have a higher conversion rate, but it also had a higher average gift. And again, you can see nothing changed between the layouts. We didn't highlight a different, you know, default ask. The arrays were the same. Everything else was the same and we varied nothing. And then we still had a higher average gift. Um, so we did decide to roll out with modals for all SMS campaigns for this particular client. Any questions on that? Okay, and I know we got to keep it moving. So if you have questions, we'll check them at the end too. Go ahead, Mike, go for it. All good. Uh, so 
Next up, we have, uh, you know, in, in discussion that we, we've already covered uh, one premium uh, test that we rolled out on social. This is uh, combining premiums with, you know, with that human element. So uh, knowing that um, participant images do increase our click through rate and uh, return on ad spend. Um, as do premiums, uh, we did want to see what the impact of having both that human element and the premium itself uh, would have on uh, on paid social ads and if that would increase lift. Next slide, please. And what we found uh, was actually the opposite. Uh, we so we did see uh, less of an uh, of an impact, uh, less uh, less click through, uh, less conversions. Uh, with this element, uh, with this version of the of the ad that had both the um, the premium and uh, and an individual and a participant um, versus just the premium alone, um, and we did also uh, test this against uh, 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 in a future iteration using a version that had um, a participant or individual actually holding the premium itself. Um, for uh, for the tote bag in the future, and th again, that's all similar similar results. Um, so what we're taking from this is, you know, there is just um, a, a bit too much going on in the um, when you have these elements combined within the ad. Um, so we're for now we're going to be keeping with the control where it is just a a premium focus. Let the let the individual uh, focus on uh, on the the benefit of making that gift. Because um, again, we saw the uh, the twenty four percent higher click through rate and eighteen percent higher conversion rate uh, and and higher ROAS uh, against our test. One of the interesting things Mike said too, and that we chatted about when we were reviewing this was, you know, in the example, obviously Mike alluded to this. You have limited real estate, right? And so giving that flag, the full real estate, is might have been what worked here. But another question we had was, you know, would it have been better if the participant was interacting with the premium right in some way or there was some kind of they were touching it or holding it and maybe that could have been the disconnect here as well so we were theorizing and hypothesizing on uh the various reasons here but that was one of the things we discussed as well and just to piggyback off of that there is a question um explaining uh premium imagery so this is literally just referring to the to the swag the gift that they get that comes with uh with their donation Next slide, please. All right, let's talk performance max. So, you know, we are, this is something that more and more clients have been rolling out over the last several months, um, just given some of the changes that there are in uh, in the, the, the data infrastructure, in the media landscape. You know, we're obviously up against a lot of competition right now um, with everything that is uh, going on in the political space uh, and, you know, greater greater competition even within uh, nonprofit media. Uh, we uh, have been testing out Performance Max across a number of different uh, clients, across different verticals, across different, um, you know, different size organizations. So I do want to preface this with it, it, it is this is certainly not something that does work a hundred percent of the time for every client um it's worth testing out um, but we do see generally speaking that kind of it works a bit stronger for those organizations that already have a bit more of a of an existing um uh brand recognition uh with throughout the ecosystem so we hypothesized that um, rolling out Performance Max, and just for those who are not currently testing it, what that is is it is a newish Google product that um, you know uses algorithmic data uh, and delivery um, across a number of um, uh, of Google properties uh, to make sure that those uh, that those ads are being delivered more especially to, to those that are highest likely to, to convert. Um, so we anticipate or we hypothesized that um, because we would be seeing these placements across different channels, you know, on YouTube, on Gmail, Google Display Network, uh, that that would help boost up our, uh, our search volume, 
uh, and we would see a, uh, a return from that. Um, any questions on this before I go into results? I realize I went through what that product is very, very quickly. Not seeing any coming through in the Q&A. Okay, next slide, please. So what we saw actually, um, you know, we, we expected this would perform at uh, results similar to um, to non-brand campaigns, which do, you know, for obvious reasons, uh, not perform quite as well as uh, as brand campaigns where folks do know, um, you know, they are specifically searching for you and how to donate to you. Um, we saw a stronger return on ad spend, and this is looking at direct results. We're talking actual dollars in the door um, than our non-brand campaigns, and it was actually comparable um, to what we saw on uh, on brand. Um, so our brand campaigns saw 27% more impressions, and that was, you know, that was bolstered from uh, we 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 expect from these additional placements that we were able to, um, you know, be present where folks were on uh, on the internet, whether through you know display banner ads, through YouTube video, uh, within their inbox on uh, on Gmail, um, to to work all together to to bolster that search volume. All right, and then demand gen uh, is another similar product uh, recently rolled out uh, from Google. Um, it is somewhat similar to uh, what used to be called discovery campaigns. Uh, there have been a you know a, a bit a couple changes kind of algorithmically and how that works and how how things deliver. Um, so we wanted to test using demand gen to once again bolster that awareness, um, but for folks that might be perhaps higher up in the funnel. Um, so delivering uh, discovery campaign, or sorry, demand gen campaigns um, to folks that uh, would show more video content toward them, show more uh, more display content. Um, and you can see on this slide a number of the placements that are uh, prioritized when one is doing a demand gen campaign, um, but we did want to see how that impact would be um against the the previous product of uh, of discovery campaigns if we can move on please so we saw some a couple pretty interesting things here one you know we wanted to roll it at, roll it out testing as an evergreen tactic um particularly to help bolster our, our prospecting efforts um so we tested that and then we also tested it during a, a tent temple campaign that was running to uh, you know more um our 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 other segments our donor segments things like that um and what we found while in this instance it did not work as well for uh for evergreen when it is paired with a tent pull campaign it did drive a stronger return than um when when campaigns had run you know when similar similar or the same campaigns had run in previous years uh without that additional element Right, and I think that is our final test. Uh, we do have a few minutes still available to to answer additional questions. I know we have a few that are in the in the Q and A, um, but ahead of that, just thank you everybody for joining. We, um, you know, we're feel free to reach out to us if you have additional questions. If you need if you need to hop, um, but otherwise, yeah, let's uh, let's open it up to questions. There's um, one question that came in when you were talking about the testing with the emergency alert test. And so no, here's the question, no significant effect on average gift for the emergency alert test? Not that we saw. Um, I can definitely get a more specific answer there though to follow up, but no, I there was not a huge impact there that I'm aware of. Do you wanna go through the wish list? Items came yeah, I think I saw. Yeah, I think I saw. Okay, Michael Meadows said, "Wish list. Have you tested a paid search like Performance Max retargeting effort after a direct mail campaign?" So we we have done some testing in terms of rolling out more audiences, more direct mail audiences. Um, you know, the thing when it comes to 
rolling out something like this, you do need a, a fairly large audience that you are that you are are, are targeting. Um, we've done co-targeting across a number of different channels. Um, I need to look specifically about um, performance max. I think we're we have one of the, one test for that in the hopper, um, but we don't have results on that yet. But that's something that you know we'll certainly um, you know. Keep a lookout for our next uh, testing webinar, whenever that might be, and perhaps we can we can discuss that then. And Mike, can I just chime in on that point and that um, to share with uh, with the group um, and the attendees? Uh, more importantly, that if um, paid advertising is always a great complementary tactic to direct mail, but you want to measure lift. Um, you know, through a more structured effort. So do a holdout. And then um, it's really important that um, to make sure that you do a match back um, on your direct mail um, returns to measure lift and and quantify kind of the value of the investment you make in a co-targeting um, campaign because um, the Returns may not be in the digital channel. It may result in um, more responses coming back, you know, through the mail channel. And if so, um, you can't lose sight of the overall revenue. That's a great point, Ben. Um, I also saw Rose had said with the plush. So I'm just kind of going back through here, guys, <laughs> and picking things out. So uh, Rose had asked, was the plush named by donors for the purpose of engagement? No, but what a fabulous idea. I love that so much. A way to kind of get engagement from people, have them vote on the name, maybe vote on where they'd like to see, uh, you know, Arthur go um, in the museum, like such a great, I can even see an awesome organic social play here with that. Um, you know, where is he? Maybe even a quiz, like where is he in the museum, right? There's so many like applications that are super fun here from a organic perspective or engagement perspective to your most engaged donors. I love that. I think that's great, but that was not the case here. Um, all right, a uh, testing wish list, digital acquisition via SMS. Same girl. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. I would love to see that. Um, what I will say for SMS, what we are seeing, and for those of you who have a mature SMS program, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir. For those who do not, I'm just going to kind of share. We see for organizations who are hope, like hoping to dip their toe in the water for SMS, your best bet in terms of generating a return are going to be in terms of select your active zero to six month digital first file. That means made a gift in the past zero to six months in digital and that's where you're going to want to start with sms now we've gotten very mature in our sms programs two three years and even more in for some clients um, and so that acquisition via sms is certainly something i'm interested in as well right so maybe like appending your selects in dm for acquisition um you know or using your acquisition list in digital and um, following that up in a, in a short form channel with a quick turnaround request and response like SMS. Um, I wonder if it would be something that we'd wanna go straight for a donation with, or if it would be something that we'd uh, maybe go with like an engagement ask or something like that, just to kind of warm them up. But um, that journey is certainly something I've thought about and is very much on our, on our radar. So not too much um, under our belts in terms of results there, but I love the thinking. And and Kayla, you know, on the vein of testing, um, I think for our client program, um, we're we're leading with a test strategy for both engagement as as the first touch after acquisition yes. versus versus donation, and more importantly, um, don't measure the result based on immediate last click performance from that touch, but really give it six to nine months because that's really yes. where you need to be evaluating kind of um, total donor, total constituent value rather than immediate um, conversion um, after the, after the, um, the first series. 
That's a great point. Um, making sure your look back windows and your viewpoints are inclusive of all KPIs of evaluation and also that they have the appropriate look back time period. So you're properly measuring effectiveness. I love that point, Pam. Um, I think that's all the time we have, but we have all of your questions in the Q&A section and we can follow up on them. But I just, I think I speak for all of us when I say thank you so much for being here with us. This was super fun. If you can't tell, we nerd out on this stuff all the time. It truly is our passion and we find it super interesting. Um, so I think there will be more of these to come. So definitely be sure to join us uh, moving forward. Thank you guys.